Hi, I want to welcome everyone today to this online Christian Church Sunday service. We are here today to continue in our journey through the Gospels, the account of our Lord upon this earth. We are in Matthew 27, verse, verses 27 through 66. Now, for those of you who are joining us live, we invite, invite you to participate um, with our poll. That's on our live Zoom meeting if you're actually in Zoom with us today. So we thank you for being here um, and answering the questions that to stimulate our minds and to focus on the word of God. Let's go ahead and begin today with the very first question. Um, Cynthia will be reading the questions here today. Cynthia, are you able to read the questions? Yes, I can. What? You also have to share the poll. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, the first question is, where was Jesus crucified? A, a hill called Golgotha. B, he was crucified at Calvary. C, he was hung on the cross at a place that means the place of a skull in English, D, all of the above. And as Pastor Lynn said, remember to communicate one another to get the answer. Yes, this is a time where you can talk with those if you're gathered with others, discuss the correct answer to this question. There is one correct answer, and then we will find it within the word of God. Now, if you are watching this later, make sure you, you hit pause um, after the question is read because we won't give you that two minutes. You'll just have to um, put your answer in the chat and then that way you have it recorded um, what your answer was and then we'll find the answer within the word of God. Delight, you're here and are you able to read scripture for us today? Yes, I can. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the palace and they gathered the whole battalion about him, 28, and they stripped off his clothes and put a scarlet robe, garment of dignity, and office worn by Roman soldiers of rank upon him, 29. And weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a wheel staff in his hand. And kneeling before him, they made sport of him, saying, Hail, greetings, good health to you, king of the Jews, 30. And they spat on him and took the reel and struck him on the head, 31. And when they finished making sport of him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own garments on him and led him away to be crucified, 32. As they were marching forth, they came upon a man of Cyrene named Simon. This man they forced to carry the cross of Jesus. 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, Latin, Calvary, which means the place of his call. 34. They offered him wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided and distributed his garments among them by casting lots so that the prophet's saying was fulfilled. They parted my garments among them and over my apparel they cast lots. 36. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. 37. And over his head, his head they put the accusation against him, the cause of his death, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. So, Delight, did you find the answer? Well, first, let's share the, the results of that, that poll today. We had 10%. We was pretty evenly divided. 10% said a hill called Gol Golgotha. 8% uh, said he was crucified at Calvary. 13% he was hung on the cross at a place that means the skull. And we had 70% say all of the above. Delight, did you find the answer to that question within? Yes, the answer is all of the above because 
Um, the scripture describes the place in different languages. In verse 33, the, the Bible called, said um, they came to the place called Golgotha. In Latin, it's called Calvary, which also means the place of his call. So it's all of the above. That is absolutely right. You know, um, we have churches called Calvary. What that really means is the skull. There was a distinct um, hill in close to Jerusalem in that time. And when you looked at it, it looked like a skull. And that was the name of the hill is the skull. Because, and that is where all the crucifixions took place. And another um, way of saying the skull is um, Golgotha. So all three are right. Thank you for finding that uh, answer within scripture for us today. The light, did you have um, any other insights concerning this portion of scripture today? Yes, indeed. Actually, this portion of scripture really blessed me. And um, I'll just share the few things that the Holy Spirit highlighted to me. From verse 28, where we, we, we read about how they stripped Jesus of his clothes and put a scarlet robe upon him. Um, thinking that they were mocking him. They were mocking him, so they thought. But they were actually fulfilling scripture because Jesus is a king. He was a king then. He is a king now. But they were doing all these things to fulfill scripture. And um, it led me to, to 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, from verse 4 to 8, where the Bible said, you know, the wisdom of God surpasses all. And that if they knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The Lord just um, made them fulfill his word without even them knowing that they were fulfilling God's word. They thought they were mocking Jesus, but they were actually fulfilling God's word. And I also see how Jesus indeed was was humble and obedient in Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 the Bible talked about Jesus being humble to the point of death and he submitted himself to the suffering and and all that he had to pass through in verse 30 I think it's 34 where the Bible says that they offered him wine mingled with gold but when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. Uh, I, I read that this, this drink is to like numb, help help the, the people numb the pain. These are soldiers that have passed, passed through rigorous training. They know pain, you know. So I believe with all the torture they were giving to Jesus, they realized that hmm, he must be in so much pain. And they tried to give him this drink. But the Bible says when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. He, he refused to receive anything to numb the pain. He gladly went through this for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He took all these things. And as human, he, he felt the pain. And that is why the Bible said he can be, he can uh, uh, and we have a high priest who has passed through all of this suffering and all of this. And I really saw it here that he experienced it and he did all this out of love for us to reconcile us back to the father. Such great sacrifice. And um, I also saw in verse 37 where um, they, after they crucified him, they divided and distributed his garments, fulfilling another scripture, um, another word from God. And finally, in verse 37, and over his head, they put the accusation against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. An accusation that was actually truth. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And I could see how the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren and how he used the Jewish people, the elders of the time, the, the, the Pharisees, the high priests. They all ganged up together 
and accuse Jesus for the truth. <laughs> he is truly Jesus, the King of the Jews. And he came to pay a price for them and for all mankind. But they called it an accusation and they accused him of that and sentenced him to death. So all of this just baffled me. And I don't want to take too much time, but if I can just read Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. That is um, a prayer I prayed after going through this scripture where it says, let the same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. Who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity, so as to assume the guise of his servants, in that he became like men and was born a human being. Verse 8, and after he had appeared in man form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross, the kind of death given to a horrible um, 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 slave and or somebody that has committed a horrible sin, you know. So this is the price that our Lord Jesus paid for us. And my heart just goes to worship and adore him the more for this sacrifice that um, he did and to help us learn this obedience and humility that he went through. Thank you. Thank you, Delight, for sharing with us so very much. You know, this is probably one of the most heart touching scriptures in any place. And there is so much to learn. The Lord also brought me to Isaiah 53 verses 5 through 12. Well, 5 through 8. But he was wounded for our transgressions. So if you have sinned, if you've gone astray, you know, we can live a good life and think that we are doing good. But if we look at scripture, which is good for correction, it says, that's the Old Testament. If we are not able to do everything that the Ten Commandments says, if it says if we fail Guess what? He was wounded. He was wounded for that transgressions. And that was what we've just read. He was whipped. We read that last week in verse 26. He had a crown of thorns placed on his head. Now, these weren't little tiny thorns like rosebush thorns. These are massive, long thorns. And they placed it on his head. And then they began beating him with a, a reed that's more like a, a thin bamboo rod. This is what our Lord did for us. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. They put a hood on him and they hit him with their fists, with him out being able to see, to deflect the, bowl, the, the blows. The chastisement needed to obtain peace. That is shalom, the peace that comes from being free of the effects of sin, the chastisement needed for peace and well-being was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we have been healed and made whole. Our Lord has done everything that we need to not let our sin get between us and God. The word says that he who is forgiven much loves much. Well, today, think about what the Lord has done so that you could be forgiven. And don't let it stand in the way your sin, guilt, um, condemnation from the enemy. Don't let it stand between you and your Lord and God because Jesus paid for that. As long as we are trying to do our best, as, not, as long as we're not habitually, continually, consistently sinning, then our Lord has paid the price. He suffered. See, verse six in Isaiah says, we have all like sheep gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has made light upon him. Made light means um, it has come upon. It is, it is impacted upon him. Him is capitalized. 
the guilt and iniquity of us all. This is what our Lord has done. And this is what our meeting is about today. We are in that place. We've seen the gospel, the birth and the life of Jesus. And now we're coming to his death. And it's so important to know that he died for you so that you could go to heaven and have eternity with the father so that in this life you can be connected with the father that you can receive healing through his stripes this was his purpose he kept his mouth shut even though he could have called 12 legions of angels to destroy the city but he kept his mouth shut so, and he took your punishment this is what our lord has done. Do you feel that today? Do you feel his love for you? Now we're going to continue reading a little bit more. Um, do any of the other elders have anything? I'm. Does anyone have any questions? The, in this meeting, you get to ask questions when you're here live. If you have any questions about the scriptures we're leading, now is the time to put it into chat. So you can receive an answer from the elders gathered here today. Cynthia, did you have something more or were you going to read the next question? I have a question that was sent and it's, um, what are your thoughts about Simon carrying Jesus cross? That is a very good question. You know, I had never, uh, stop to think about that in particular we know that according to the word that he received received lashes so much so that it was a cat of nine tails it had little pieces of metal woven into this this whip that had nine ends on it and it would pull out his flesh so he had so much flesh pulled out of his back that he was unable to carry the cross what the Holy Spirit is saying to me right now is that having a man carry that cross is symbolic of, of mankind. It was because of mankind. You know, the cross is what Jesus was nailed to. He received nails to hang on the cross. It was, um, it was because of man that he had to be placed on the cross. So it was man who carried that cross. He didn't have any sin. He didn't have any need to hang on the cross. He, he had done nothing wrong. So it was right that man carried it and not him. That was God's will to show that it was man because of man. His son would be placed on the cross for man that it would be done. I hope that helps whoever answered that question. And thank you for answering it. Um, next, do we have a, are we ready to continue on to the next question now today? I, um, I just thought about how, verse 28, how they stripped off his clothes. And it's like the old man. This, it's like taking off the old man, all that he went through here on this earth um, for us. But then when he's getting on the, on the cross, he's robed with scarlet, um, a garment, a garment of royalty, a, a garment of, you know, that the soldiers wore. And it's, it was red. And I looked up the color and I thought about also what um, what Delight had talked about. I, I too, had looked up to see um, Gaul, what the, the thing that was in the drink. And I was, you know, it's like they were, as you were saying, they were trying to help him not to be in pain, but also they still were kind of kind of marking him because it's it's a bitter taste. It's not a good taste. It's really nasty. So um yeah. It was and, also poisonous. Yeah. So by taking that gall, he would have been committing suicide. Yes. I, this, I did find that as well in Deuteronomy. Yes. So Thank this you. was the reason why he couldn't take it. Yes. It's because if he had taken it then he was killing himself. So he yeah. had to reject it and, and not, not take that to ease his pain to end his life before he had taken all the sin upon himself. So great addition about that gall and, and the fact that he it would have eased his pain. He could have eased his suffering, but then it wouldn't have been complete because he would have been ending his life prematurely. 
letting man do it. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, Delight. I mean, I see Delight's unmuted and Denise had her hand raised. Go ahead, Delight. Thank you. Um, just to add to the question that was asked and your answer concerning um, Simon carrying the cross. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was talking about um, man carrying his cross, you know, take up your cross and follow me. Um, so I see it as the price he came to pay, man also has a part in it. Yes, he, through his blood, we can receive forgiveness, but there are things man, as humans, we're expected to do. We're expected to recognize the sin, confess them, you know, ask that his blood will cover those sin. And, and yes, carry our cross like uh, Matthew 10. He who loves and takes more pleasure in father or mother, more than in me is not worthy of me. And he who loves and take more pleasure in son or daughter is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me, cleave steadfastly to me, confirming, conforming wholly to my example in leading and if need be in dying also is not worthy of me. So I believe that like you rightly said, the Holy Spirit was saying that it's for man he was doing this. So man has to actually carry that cross and play their own part in receiving that which Jesus came to do. Yeah, see, Jesus had no sin. He had no cross to bear. He had led the perfect life, which made him this, the one and only eternal sacrifice that would um, pave the way for us to come into heaven. And so his, his, he was obedient unto death. That was the cup he had to drink from, but he didn't have the burden of sin. So thank you, Delight, for finding that in scripture to back up what the Holy Spirit was saying. Thank you for that. Now, um, Denise, you had something else as well. Did you want to contribute? I, I was going to say that too, but it's also in Luke 9, 23. And, and he said that if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so it, it's it's like Simon Serene, whenever they, of Serene, when they gave him the cross, he had to deny himself and follow Jesus taking that cross. So I was just going to piggyback off of that. I mean, I was going to say that, but she said it very well. Thank you, Denise. And you're right. You know, you know, Simon was going in Jerusalem about his own business when they grabbed him to carry the cross. That is a very accurate portrayal, 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 portrait, an accurate portrait. How about that? Of man um, focusing on Jesus and what Jesus needs for us, what he is, he is our Lord now, he is our owner and he's our master and focusing on what he wants us to do despite anything throughout our walk in life as we walk through life. So thank you for that today, Denise. Anyone else who has something to contribute or Cynthia, will, are you ready to read the next question? I believe I am ready. Let me launch it. What physical signs happen in connection with the death of Jesus? A, darkness came upon the land. B, the veil in the temple that encloses the Holy of Holies was split into C, an earthquake hit Jerusalem, D, all of the above. Again, we will have about two minutes for each one of you to make your selection. So if you are gathered with a group, talk it over, make a selection for one. If you are joining us later, um, you can enter it into the chat. Or if you're live on YouTube, I believe you can also chat on YouTube as well and enter it live on YouTube. Um, I think we are at that two minute mark now. So we're gonna end the poll. And it seems that we had a few people choose B, the veil in the temple that encloses the holies of holies was split in two. And we had 94% say D, all of the above. Henry, would you be so kind as to read uh, scriptures 38 through 54 and help us find the answer to this question? With pleasure. 38. At the same time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. 39. And those who passed by spoke reproachfully and abusively and jeered at him, wagging their heads. And they said, You who would tear down the sanctuary of the temple and rebuild it in three days, 
rescue yourself from death. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. 41. And in the same way, the chief priests and the scribes and elders made sport of him, saying, He rescued others from death. Himself he cannot rescue from death. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in and acknowledge and cleave to him. 43. He trusts in God. Let God deliver now. Let God deliver him now, if he cares for him, and we will have him. And uh, for he said, I am the Son of God. 44. And the robbers who were crucified with him also abused and reproached and made sport of him in the same way. 45. Now from the sixth hour, noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. 3 o'clock, 46, and about the ninth hour, 3 o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me, leaving me helpless, forsaken, and failing me in, the, in my need? 47, and some of the bystanders when they heard it, said, This man is calling for Elijah. 48. And one of them immediately ran and took a sponge, soaked it with vinegar, a sour wine, and put it on a reed staff, and was about to give it to him to drink. 49. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him from death. 50. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. 51. And at once the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. 52. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep in death were raised to life. 53. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. 54. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus observed the earthquake and all that was happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. So Henry, did you find the answer to that question within the text? Not what happened at the moment of death, but in connection with the death, death of Jesus. In connection, indeed, is the key word there, because uh, all the three aspects that were uh, in the question were, were, we could see that in connection with his death. So the answer should be D, all of the above. Amen. And that is true. You know, um, the, the darkness that came upon the land, the Holy Spirit was just pointing it out as you were reading it. That um, darkness lasted three hours. A solar eclipse when the sun is blocked out how long does that usually last that darkness is upon the whole land not three hours no or the sun the, the earth moves too quickly and so this was a supernatural eclipse um that the lord that god did and i i i think it was representing the fact that that sin was coming upon jesus and when he cried out and he said um he cried out to the father, why have you forsaken me? You see, that's because the sin that we all mankind would commit throughout all time was being placed upon him. And sin is a barrier between us and God. And so at that moment, all that sin was crowding in and he no longer felt the father. For the first time in his life, he was alone. And he was like, where have you gone? This is my time of need. Where, father, are you? And that was the cry and it shows that that darkness that darkness of sin that blocks out the light of our god came upon jesus as he hung on the cross such a thing our lord has done sorry henry i 
I jumped in. I couldn't help myself um, with this portion of scripture. It is just so glorious what God has done. Did you have something as well concerning this portion of scripture? Yes, it is in the same uh, vein as what you were talking about. It, it's, it's such a glorious thing that the Lord Je Jesus had done on the cross by being there for uh, for so long and uh, and the supernatural the supernatural eclipse was just amazing uh, what was dawning on me was uh, uh, around the same uh, same subject uh, as he was on the cross um he was he felt the dis um, the disconnect with the father i mean he he said my god my god why have you forsaken me but throughout the gospels as we read jesus is talking to the Father, his, his prayers to the Father, he will call the Father, Father. He will call God, Father. And, and continuously, he will, he will do that because he's the Son of God. Whereas human being, we will call the Father, we will call him God. So Jesus, the Son of God, will call God, Father. And human will call God, God. But on the cross, he switched that. He said, my God, my God, so that us too, we can now become um, eligible, <laughs> if I can say it like that, eligible to call God our Father because of that transaction that Jesus did on the cross. He switched, uh, he, 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 he took on him our sins so that we can become justified through his righteousness. And so that, that was done on me that he did that transaction and he called God, my, 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 my God, my God, so that we can now call the Father, Father. And that, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so <laughs> that's one of the things I wanted to contribute. Yeah, please carry on. <laughs> that is absolutely beautiful. I had not thought of that before, that his, his vocabulary changed. You see, when... Um, mankind before Jesus, all those of us who were Gentiles, who were not born Jewish, we were without God. That, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, Israel called him father, but the rest of us only called him God. And we had no way of having a relationship with God because mm -hmm. we had no atonement for our sin. We had nothing that we could do to have that relationship with him as our Abba, Father. Jesus walked in that relationship as, as Abba and fa Father, and then as he took that sin upon himself, he was reduced to what we were before we became Christians, of just calling him God. Oh, that's such a beautiful thing Jesus has done. If the, if the kingdom of darkness knew what they were doing, the door they would open for all of mankind, they would not have crucified him, because now all mankind is eligible to call um God, Father, because of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Henry, for sharing that today. Was there something else? Yes, just another aspect uh, quickly. Uh, uh, it is uh, the, um, the bodies of the saints that were resurrected uh, in verse 52. It was amazing to see that uh, the saints of the Old Testament, some that were around that, that, that area, they were resurrected. And we know that in, uh, in Revelation, uh, when the Lord mentioned in, uh, I believe in Revelation chapter 20, that uh, people will be resurrected, uh, those who believe in the Lord, that they, um, that they dedicated their lives to the Lord and who are considered saints, they will be the, the resurrected and given eternal bodies glorious bodies and so it's good to see that uh, there is already uh, that at the, at the resurrection of Jesus those who were um, raised at his death were were able to walk into the street the street of Jerusalem and many saw them so that was uh, that was just uh, it was wonderful to see to see that there is a, like a little snippet a little uh, little snapshot or little opening of what the Lord would do as a result of uh, the wonderful, glorious job that Jesus did on the cross for us. So that was my other aspect. So thank oh, you. Oh, <laughs> that is another beautiful point that we have here today. And guess what, Henri? Uh, the Lord brought me to a similar, similar conclusion. Um, that earthquake that happened and when the dead were raised, it was, it was a testimony that something great has happened, that the Messiah has come. And it, and 
the Bible says that God never changes, that what he does once, he'll do again. In the Old Testament, there are many foreshadows of what will happen in the New Testament. We can see that God did something in, in a certain way, then he did it again with his son, Jesus, right? Well, guess what? Jesus's death and resurrection is a foreshadow of something that's coming. If we go to the book of Revelation and we go to chapter 11, we see that there will be two witnesses upon this earth. There'll be that, that are, that are hmm, doing, uh, calling down many things to show that they are speaking with God and they're preparing the world for the return of the Lord and that they are killed in Jerusalem. So when you see two people hated by the world, killed in Jerusalem, you know that these are the two witnesses, two witnesses because the Antichrist will not allow their bodies to be buried. And then we see in 11, chapter 11, verse 11, it says, and after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud with their, and their enemies beheld them. So guess what? The whole world sees that these two witnesses are raised from the dead and that they are brought up to heaven. And then on verse 13, it says, and at the same hour, there is a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell in that earthquake. And there were slain a map of men, 7,000, 7,000 people died in an earthquake in Jerusalem. And it says the rem remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God in heaven. So we see that this happened with our Lord, that when he died, um, that the saints were resurrected. And as that happened, there was this huge earthquake. And even the Roman soldiers said, oh, my gosh, we've seen darkness upon the earth. We saw him cry out and we saw him give up his own spirit and die. And then an earthquake happened. Surely this is the son of God. This is an amazing thing. And it will be happening again. Now, I want to point out that in some of the other chapters, um, this there's a little bit of a, a time dis distance between when he died, when the earthquake happened, and when the dead were raised. The other uh, eyewitness accounts shows that he died, and then it was some time before the graves opened, and, and, the, and they came out. I believe that was when Jesus was ascending, that all that took place. Um, okay, that is what I have today. Thank you, Henry, for um, the Holy Spirit is bringing us in agreement here today. Do any of the other elders um, have something to contribute? We have some. This is a beautiful portion of scripture for all of those who love our Lord. So let's let let's let Denise go first, then we'll go Gail, and then we'll go Denise, uh, then we'll go Delight. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention about the um, veil being um, torn in two in the um, temple, you know, letting us know that we did not have to go through the priest. Now Christ was opening the way for all of us. So that's what I wanted to mention. I, I thought that was such a, a beautiful thing that no longer did you have to go to the priest to get the God, you know, or, you know, do all the rituals. Now it was open to everyone and, you know, um, our way to Jesus is, um, it's awesome <laughs> that now we don't have to, it, it, I guess, you know, for one thing, only the Jews could do it. Um, you had to go to the high priest. And now when the veil was torn, now it opened it up for the Gentiles as well. That is a beautiful um, thing to bring out here today. Thank you for mentioning that, Denise. And you're right. Back in Israel, when um, they had something called the Holies of Holies, and it was separated from the rest of the temple by this curtain that God had them make, made. And only the high priest, only the highest of highest could go into the Holies of Holies. And, and when they did, when the priest had to go in there, they would actually tie a rope on them and they had bells on their garment because God would strike them dead if there was any open sin in their lives. And, and so the, when the bells stopped ringing from their movement, they would know that the priest had died and they would pull him out from the holies of holies. Um, it was a place reserved for a select few. 
And with the death of our Lord, we now have access to our God. We can come boldly before his throne, each and every one of us. What a beautiful thing our God has done. He has torn that veil, that, that barrier between us and our Father in heaven. Okay, um, any other, uh, we had uh, two more people. Gail, did you have something as well? I did. And it kind of piggybacks off of what everybody else has been saying. So first off, we talked a lot about that this is the Passover and that he is the lamb and how um, it really reminded me of the Passover story. And we have the hardening of hearts, like Pharaoh hardened his heart. And I did not put the connection until you just were talking about it. But in the um, Exodus story, the darkness, uh, the plague of darkness is three days. And I did not catch until you said that, that it was three hours. So there's the correlation between those two. And then Denise brought up the veil and that is so beautiful how it ripped. The thing about the veil is that um, we know from Exodus that it was over four inches thick. It was the at least the breadth of a man's hand. So it's not something that just ripped. It's something that God ripped. I mean, ripped, obviously. And on the veil were cherubim. And the cherubim were to represent just from the Garden of Eden, even how the cherubim stood at theirs and we couldn't approach God. And now that's been removed. And the cherubim, we also know from Ezekiel, when we were studying revelations in Ezekiel, that he saw um, the cherubim in front of God at the throne. And I, I, just the the amazing ability that Jesus, all he went through, opened up that veil and how now we can go to God. And it just how much the Passover story was fulfilled. It's just amazing to me. That is some beautiful addition there. I had not even considered that that three hours of darkness is symbolic of that, of the three days. Um, or uh, So that is a beautiful correlation along with that, that, that veil was so thick. It was more like a wall. Could you imagine a, um, something that was hand woven that is literally, you know, four inches thick. It's, it's thick. No human could tear that. It had, it had to be God in heaven sending an angel to open the way to him once more. A beautiful addition to this. Um, Delight, did you have something concerning this portion of scripture as well? Yes, actually, I just wanted to piggyback on what he was saying, Pastor Len, on from verse 50, where he says, And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And I saw in John chapter 10, from verse 17, where he said, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my own life to take it back again. Verse 18, no one takes it away from me. On the contrary, I lay it down voluntarily. I put it from myself. So um, just like you said, he was not, he was crucified. He was not really murdered or killed. He gave up his spirit. He voluntarily did it. He, he he knew that was what he was doing and he gave it up. So that's just so great. Yes, you see, death had no right over him because he didn't have any sin. And so no one, no man could take it from him. He had to volunteer to die. And that's what he did. And it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Delight, for highlighting that once more. Also, I want to mention for everyone here, if you want to know more about the death um, and resurrection and all that of Jesus, there is a movie that I do recommend. It's called Case for Christ. It's about a reporter who was an atheist. He was a Nobel or a, Pulter, uh, a prize winning uh, a journalist who whose wife had become a Christian and he was an atheist. and He was annoyed at his wife. So he decided and set out to prove that that the Bible was wrong, that it was all a fairy tale. And he and he looked at the death of Jesus. And there is so much in there that he proved. For instance, the fact that the, the flesh was taken off of his back, that means he had no uh, back muscles, right? And when you're hanging out like this, um, and, and at that angle, there would be blood filling up in your lungs. And in order to breathe, you would have to use your back muscle, muscles in order to breathe. He went and consulted all these doctors and to see if a man could survive on the cross and come to life later. And there, it was impossible to endure all that he did 
and then then actually be healed from it naturally without supernatural intervention. Okay, um, we do have one more question here today. Or Cynthia, did you have something else concerning this portion? Yes, I thought about um, our meeting that we had um, hearing from the Holy Spirit. Um, when I looked at verse 46, when it talked about when Jesus was saying, why have you abandoned me? And when we were doing the um, the hearing from the Holy Spirit, sometimes, you know, you feel that God has abandoned you and you can see this Jesus. He's in, he's in the flesh. And, but he, even though he felt he was abandoned, it's like us, even though we might feel we're abandoned, we know from reading the word of God that God is always with us, that we're never by ourselves. And this, you know, I probably, cause we just did that meeting, but it just really um, stuck out to me. Cause I was like, we're not by ourselves. You know, he was there for, you know, by himself for moments, like you praying and, you know, God's, you feel God's not answering your prayer, but he is, but everything is in his timing. So that I just wanted to share that. Yes. E even though Jesus for the first time didn't feel that connection with God, it doesn't mean that God was not watching. God was, did not know what was going on. Thank you for that addition, Cynthia, today. We have a question today, and it, like I said, if you're here live, you're able to ask questions. The question is, are the two witnesses two individuals, two groups, or two churches, and why are there two? Um, that is a question about the book of Revelation at the Living Word website. You can find it, the event, too, on onlinechristianchurch.com on the events page, a link to our meeting it happens once a month about the book of Revelations. So we don't want to get sidetracked here and talk about um, the book of Revelation because there's so much. We would be here for a long time. So bring your questions to that meeting. You can always email them in in preparation so that scriptures can be gathered. Um, the, the questions can, can be answered with the help of the Holy Spirit, but finding them in scripture can be helpful if the, if the questions are emailed in. Um, so we will not answer that question today. So just a reminder, there is a once a month meeting meeting for the book of Revelation. We have another question too um, from from Pedro and, Ro and Jose. Um, Cynthia, did you want to read that? Uh, Jason would like to read it. If that's okay. Yep. Jason, thank you for reading that. I'm glad you're able to connect. Uh, yeah. So um, the moment where Israel people stopped having direct access to God was a moment where the people refused to talk directly to God and asked Moses to make link. And after that moment, only priests, prophets, kings had access had a direct access to God. I don't know if we want to have them raise their hand or what to clarify. I think what they're asking is, it, it, was that the defining moment when people had no more access to God, right? Um so I, I've studied this a little bit and the Jewish uh, people, Israel, they um, say they have, they have said that when God gave those 10 commandments to them, they actually took it to all the other nations and asked all the other nations if they would like to be, to worship God. And here's the 10 commandments. Here are his ways. And all of them declined. And this is the reason why only Israel um, was the only nation that was dedicated unto God. And if we look at what happened there, the nation of Israel, um, Moses, the, the mountain, right? The, it was, I think, probably a volcano. There was all kinds of stuff happening on this mountain, shaking and rumbling and lights and, and thunder. And and um, and God called Moses up and, and Israel literally said, oh, please, no, Moses, you go and talk to God and tell us what he says, lest we die. They cursed themselves saying that only Moses could go. If they tried to go, they would die. And so at that time it was established because that is what they asked for. And so that is why we see in um, God honoring their request and establishing his ways, his temple, the way the sacrifices had to do, the priests that he called that would be sanctified to him. And so God created this system with Israel, but his perfect will was for all of mankind to be able to come to him as father. And he had a plan from the very beginning. He knew he had a plan. He chose Israel for a purpose. And eventually, yes, 
when Jesus died, then the rest of the world is now eligible once more. Um, even all of those who had rejected God, who had heard of God and, and weren't following his ways were now eligible to come into his presence. I hope that answers the question, uh, Pedro and, and Jose. If there aren't any more questions, we will continue because this is, meeting is going a very long time. Um, let's go on to the next question. Cynthia, will you read that for us here today? Yes. A rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who also was a disciple of Jesus, did what for our Lord after he was crucified? A, ask Pilate for the body. B, wrap Jesus' body in white cloth. C, place the body of our Lord in his undefined tomb. D, all of the above. Okay, so here's another question for you to discuss for the next two, uh, two minutes. A rich man from Arimathea, I believe is how it's pronounced, named Joseph. He did something for our Lord after he is crucified. What was it? Discuss this. We have about one minute more. We are at that two minute mark now. So we're going to go ahead and end that poll, share the results. And 100% said D, all of the above, that he asked Pilate for the body. He wrapped Jesus's body in a white cloth and he placed the body of our Lord in his undefiled tomb. Okay, who do we have reading here today? Um, Denise, could you read this final portion of scripture for us? Yes, 55. There were also numerous women there looking on from a distance who were of those who had accompanied Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary of Magdala, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's son. sons. 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man for, from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. 58. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. 59. And Joseph took the body and rolled it up in a clean linen cloth used for swathing dead bodies. 60. And laid it in his own fresh undefiled tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. And he rolled a big boulder over the door of the tomb and went away. 61. And Mary of Magdala and the other Mary kept sitting there opposite the tomb. 62. The next day, that is, the day after the day of preparation for the Sabbath, the chief priest and the Pharisees assembled before Pilate, 63, and said, Sir, we have just remembered how that vagabond imposter said while he was still alive, and after three days I will rise again. 64. Therefore, Give an order to have the tomb made secure and safeguarded until the third day for fear that his disciples will come and steal him away and tell the people that he has risen from the dead and the last deception and fraud will be worse than the first. <laughs> 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, take them and go. Make it as secure as you can. 66, so they went off and made the tomb secure by sealing the boulder, a guard of soldiers being with them and remaining to watch. Yes, I found it is um, 58 and 59 and 60. Um, um, oh, well, uh, I should say 57, 59 and 60. It was uh, Joseph of Arimathea um, asked for the body. And um, he asked that it be laid uh, and he took the body and he, you know, um, put clean, clean linen clo cloth over it. And then he also laid it in his undefiled tomb. And he so it was, um, well, I'd say 57, 58, 59 and 60. That's right. It's all three are correct. That means D, all of the above is the right answer. And indeed, um, Joseph, the rich man who was a disciple of Jesus, did all of these things for our Lord. 
Um, Denise, did you have anything to share concerning the scriptures today? Yes, I, I, I realized that, you know, for them to not, um, uh, I guess I want to say, it's like the women were there all along. You know, they were on the side watching Jesus when he was crucified. They were there um, at, when they laid him in the tomb, but the disciples weren't there. The men weren't there, but the women were there. And I thought that that was very interesting because, um, um, you know, some religions don't acknowledge women as being any leaders or teaching men or because of what Paul said. But um, when you look here, you see that the women were uh, the women were present and the men were not. So um, I just thought that was um, really interesting and, and really um, it was a blessing. Well, you know, um, women were created to be help helpers of men. And it says that those the part one of those women were there. They were there supporting Jesus in his ministry. Um, they were helpers of him. And you're right. They held to him. They cleaved to him. And, and they were the ones there at the cross. Um, in one of the other versions, it says that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was there, too, as well. So we have both women and men there present at that crucifixion, as that at that horrible moment with our Lord. Um, also, the Lord brought to me that how much this rich man invested you know, um, Jesus said that it was harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a, a camel going through the eye of the needle. It was practically impossible. But we see here an example of what uh, what a wealthy disciple of Jesus truly looks like. Not only um, did he did he go to government officials, not only did he intercede in the government to honor our Lord, but he also um, wrapped him, had him wrapped in this expensive cloth. He paid for the burial, the, what was necessary. And he gave his own tomb. Now, that is very significant. In Israel, during that time, um, you had, if you were um, the head of your household, if you were the firstborn son, you, it was your honor and your duty to carve out your own tomb. It was super expensive. There's this rocky mountain and you had to carve out your own place and it would begin the burial of your family line with your death. You would be the first person um, buried in that tomb. That's why it was undefiled because we know a dead body can defile something according to the word of God that we're not supposed to handle dead bodies. And if we do, then there's seven days to be purified with God. So there was no other dead body. And he gave this expensive gift to our Lord. He gave his very own tomb that he had worked throughout his life in order to prepare for his death. It was, it was such a gift. And it was a beautiful thing that he did for our Lord, gave him an appropriate place that he needed, um, the undefiled place. And we see later in scripture why it's important that it was undefiled. Do any of the other elders have something to contribute concerning this last portion of scripture today? Go right ahead, Delight. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking of what Denise said about the disciples not being around, right? And if you... <clears throat> excuse me um we've come to know that there were about seven words of jesus on the cross and different writers of the epistles gave different of those words to make up seven we see in in, in this chapter of matthew that we've just read that he only said my god my god why have you forsaken me um in other epistles we see where he he said to the two thieves that were crucified, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. Then there was another one where he said to John, behold your mother and mother, behold your, your son. So I'm just, <laughs> when she said that, oh, probably that's why maybe each one caught different things that Jesus said at different times. You know, <laughs> it just came to me and I'm trying to put them together, probably for fear of being also crucified being that they were Jesus's apostles, um, they would just, you know, go see what's going on and run away or or what. But I just um, see that in different epistles, they, they, they captured different things that Jesus said. 
Thank you, Delight, for that. And you're right, that it is important to, that's the reason why we have the four accounts, the four gospels, that the gospel is considered the good word, the good message from God. And we have four accounts because each person sees from their own perspective. And, you know, the, the authorities will tell you that if two eyewitnesses uh, say exactly the same thing, then it's rehearsed and not authentic. So we see it and we put it together and we say, this is the fullness of what happened. It's seen from slightly different perspectives. And Matthew focused on the three women and, and other, um, other messages focus on, on another part of that crucifixion, which is why we will continue going through the Gospels and we'll look at um, Mark and uh, Matthew, Mark and Mark and Luke um, in the future. Is there anything else from any of the other um, elders here today to contribute to this portion of scripture? I do. Uh, I, I, th I think it was interesting that they were still trying to discredit Jesus, even after he um, had given up his spirit and was placed in a tomb. They were still trying to um, discredit his word that he's coming back, <laughs> even after all that. And that is so true. Even the Roman guards, those who weren't Jewish, it said, oh my gosh, this must be the son of God after all those things happened in connection with his, his death. Yet those who knew the scripture, those who Pilate had asked and said, when is Jesus, uh, the Messiah supposed to come? Um, it, those who should have known there was such a stronghold of the enemy. They weren't not true sons of God because they held on they wanted to hold on to their power so much they refused to believe dis despite all the all the happenings all the signs that god did at jesus's death so that is a great point that they were still cleaving to um their own interests Pilate even said it was because of their jealousy um that they had done this because they were jealous of the power that jesus was wielding the authority with which he spoke the connection to god was there anything else um, here today? Henry, did you have something to share? Yes, just briefly on uh, the behavior of um, the elders and chief priests. We can see that uh, when Jesus was on the cross, they were they had a wording that was almost as uh, the wording that uh, the accuser um, tempted Jesus with in the desert uh, three years prior. and. And even after Jesus' death, they still were unsettled. They went to Pilate to request uh, that the, the tomb be sealed and so on and so forth because they were still unsettled. So you can see that there was just, uh, they could see the error and, uh, and they, were, they were anxious, anxious inside, seeing that, uh, well, this is happening and uh, he's now dead and uh, they, it's going to get worse if they don't do something. So you could see that, that aspect and uh, it just dawned on me that uh, b based on how they behave, now they are seeing some consequences of that. And, uh, and it's just the encouragement that I'm seeing here is... Uh, is to be quite mindful of the thoughts, mindful of the influences and, and uh, discern the influences so that we can focus on what the Holy Spirit is bringing to us, what the Holy Spirit is teaching us to be led by Him. For the Word did say that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So it is, it is fit, it is proper, it is suitable to uh, to to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit in our dealings. So that's what I wanted to contribute. Thank you. You know, that is such a great connection to make. We have seen um, when we read through other sections of Matthew, how the devil had tempted Jesus by saying, if you are the son of God, do this. If you are truly uh, the Messiah, do that. You know, and here we have others siding with the enemy while he's on the cross, throwing those same temptations at him. And we know that they were then speaking with the voice of Satan. It was the enemy that was speaking through them at Jesus, even while he hung on the cross. Thank you for that connection, Henry. That was a beautiful connection to make. Do we have any other contributions here today? I have a question. Um, it kind of goes with the question that's in the chat 
was Joseph related since the word of God mentions that it is close relatives that permit it to handle a dead body? Okay. So we actually, um, scholars have researched this and they believe that Ju that Joseph was actually Mary's uncle. Um, it, it specifically says Joseph of Arimathea. It's important to make that distinction because one of the things Jesus said in his ministry was that a prophet is not respected in his own hometown by his family, right? And so um, his mother, Mary, and his brothers didn't really respect him as the son of God and a prophet until after his resurrection, um, after his death. But Joseph was actually from another city. He was a more distant relative. But according to Jewish law, you had to be related to someone in order to ask for the dead body and to care for it. And so we, we see that um, most scholars believe that he was an uncle um, through Mary. So I hope that helps. And isn't it poetic that Mary um, was the biological part of Jesus? Remember, she had no relation with Joseph, her husband. It was the Holy Spirit who came in and made Jesus. And so God was so um, faithful to his word that it was a family member. Indeed, the biological connection was still there. And it was he who requested the body of Jesus. Were that, was there another question, Cynthia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he have to do, Joseph, did he have to do something for seven days after he touched him? Um, one would think that according to Jewish tradition, you would. But from what I understand concerning the spiritual realm, when we die, you know, any um, demon spirits that have been interfering in our life have an attachment to us and they have a, a warm place. Um, it, uh, demons don't like to be cast out into dry places that are without a body, right? And so when you go and handle a dead body, any spirits connected to that body may try and, and move into you, into your own life. And I think that's why there was that seven day of purification. It was a dedication to God so that he could remove any spirits that might have been attached. And so they didn't want that spirit passed around. With our Lord, there was nothing but the Holy Spirit. He was not contaminated in any way. So I don't think there would have been a need for purification, but according to Jewish law, he would have had have, have had this seven days of purification ritual after handling the dead body. I hope that answers that question, Cynthia. Did you have anything else for us? Um, any other questions coming in today? No, I don't have anything else. Well, this meeting has gone on for an hour and a half. I thank you all for being here with us through this journey. Um, through this day where we are seeing what our Lord has done, all, all that he endured for us, that he suffered, and, and the glorious signs that our God sent to show us what was accomplished with his death. I pray that each one of you who have joined us here today love your Lord, knowing that because of him you have been forgiven much. Thank you for joining with us here today gathering together online for this Sunday service. Let's pray as we end this service today. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that you are our Lord, our owner and our master. Each person who has acknowledged that you are the son of God, that you died and raised on the third day, I thank you that you are their Lord. I thank you for helping them to see who you are, to learn your ways, to apply them to the, your, their lives so they can become free, free of all the effects of sin. You have paid the price. So I place each one into your hands today. As we leave this meeting, for those who are here live and will listen later, Lord, I just ask that you bless them that you keep them. Let your face, all that you are, shine upon them. Let them know you more. Let them experience more of your shalom. 